Hi, everybody. This is Terry here. We are going to do our training on becoming a better group leader. Let me get this presentation shared. Let me share screen. Here we go. So you should see the screen that says group facilitating. So, um, yeah, so we're doing group facilitating. You have the team. That's me and Jojo. And this is group facilitation is the art of making it easy for groups to interact and work together to achieve goals. Facilitators pay attention to the process of what is going on and how everybody is interacting. Good facilitators are more like coaches than directors. They help guide the group and keep it on track by sharing their experiences and their knowledge, but they encourage the people in the group to be take ownership of the group and to uh, become a good group member. So I want to share a video with you from Mentor, uh, the national office. So Okay, so here Almost everywhere you look, you'll find a group of young people. Maybe you see a few friends just hanging out in your neighborhood, or attending an after-school program, playing on a sports team, or participating in a club. Groups can help young people feel like they belong to something important. More and more, mentoring programs are adopting a group model in which one or more mentors interact with multiple youth on a regular basis. Some youth programs, like sports teams or art clubs, make intentional efforts to incorporate mentoring into their ongoing activities. And even in the mentoring relationships that happen in schools or community settings, there is always the possibility that other young people will be around when a mentor and mentee are meeting and may want to be involved in what they are doing. As a mentor, there may be times when you find yourself engaging in a group of young people, planned or otherwise, and in your mentoring role, group facilitation is your most valuable skill. Group facilitation is the art of making it easy for a group of people to interact and work together to achieve goals. Facilitators pay attention to the process of what is going on in a group and how group members are interacting. To effectively facilitate group interactions, help group members decide how they want to interact by developing ground rules and agreements that everyone can agree on. Develop a regular sequence of activities and routines to help structure the group's time together, as well as create a sense of ownership and belonging. A good facilitator makes sure everyone gets what they need, make sure one person isn't dominating, and that all members are participating in the way that makes sense for their styles. Finally, group facilitation works best when it is a reflective practice. Ask yourself, are group members feeling a sense of ownership? Is anyone dominating or being left out? Ask the mentees to reflect also, are they getting out of the group what they had hoped for? How might things be changed to help them get more out of it? Group members want to build, learn, and grow with you and other members of the group. So, as you reflect and adapt your approach, don't forget to enjoy time with your group and have fun. See the full chapter at mentoring.org slash better mentor for more tips on how you can be a better mentor. All right, that's pretty fantastic. Becoming a better yeah. mentor. Yeah. Strategies to be there for young people. Understanding effective online communication. Mm. Mentoring is... Okay, sorry. Didn't turn the video off. It just auto-played the next thing. Always helpful. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation. All right, so the effective practices that we're going to go over and summarize are expectations, recognizing the group formation stages, and allowing for contextual considerations, and then questions, not uh, necessarily that you need to ask me, you might 
have questions or not, but questions to ask yourself as you're going through the process. So setting clear expectations is super important, especially at Echo Glen, where you have a lot of youth who are dysregulated emotionally and don't um, just automatically like know how to behave in a group setting. So we have a group that we run and we have some really cute rules. We have the vegan rule, which means leave your beef at the door. The Vegas rule, which is what's set in group, stays in group, pretty common. One diva, one mic, one person talks at a time. The Aretha rule, which is R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And then uh, speak from your own experience. Um, and then every week, the youth, as they're naming them, sometimes they add another rule and sometimes not. It, it just depends on what they're feeling that day. Establish group rituals and routines to help create a group identity. So a group identity is going to be created by the purpose of the group, right? So the um, program logic for the group, like what outcomes do you want the group have? And then you build a program to meet the outcomes and then establishing the rituals within that context. So we have a check in, check out process that always includes who they the youth are and then how they're feeling that day and then some weird rando question that uh you know we only ask teenagers so um that is in our check-in and then we have uh, more of a reflective checkout but it's pretty similar to our check-in just like the opposite and then as a facilitator, you need to uh, help everybody participate fully and equally. There's a phrase that is common in group facilitation called step up, step back, which means encouraging the people that don't talk so much to step up and the people who talk a lot to step back. And maybe that should be a ground rule because sometimes we um, have those problems. So group formation stages, um, you may have heard these before, and I personally heard the for forming, storming, norming stages all the time and wasn't really thoughtful of the performing and the adjourning, but they're so important every single stage. I mean, forming is when you are beginning to form together. Um, with the group at Echo, it feels a lot of times like you're always in a forming stage because kids are being added or they're leaving. Um, and it can be a bit chaotic because the forming and storming stages, the people begin to define themselves. Conflict is common when they are not sure of who they are or who others are or what the group is and how it's working together. So really developing that program logic model is really important because you can uh, say your purpose and that gives you at least one foundation. Norming is when the group begins to work as a unit. And then performing is when they're really productive and they're able not only to work as a unit, but to be generative in their ideas and their creativity and their solutions to whatever it is that is before them. And then adjourning. Sometimes things end and it's a skill to really recognize when a group no longer serves its purpose. You either need to have a new purpose or you need to send the group off and close it down in a good way. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of communities for which that is really difficult. They hold on until the very end, and then it becomes uh, more painful than it actually has to be because we, our society does not do goodbyes very easily or endings easily. So if we could just figure out how to do an ending in a good way, we would be in good shape. So contextual considerations. Um, so the basic elements of group facilitation are to share, encourage, and to refrain from directing. So you don't wanna tell everybody what to do all the time. Like that's for your house, not for group. Um, tailor group activities to the ages in the, of people in the group. And you may even tailor it to the cultural context of the group. Size matters of groups, so you must be manageable in size and allow for members to contribute meaningfully equally, allowing for that step up and step back. 
if it gets too big and you can't manage the size, especially at Echo Glen, that is a target for something bad to happen. We had um, in one of our, so our group now averages about eight kids and we had um, uh, probably two years ago, we were averaging about 20 kids and at the most we had 25. In that, when we had that happen, when we were that big and we still only had um, two volunteer leaders and at that time we only had one staff person, the staff people would walk their youth to our group and then the one staff person would stay and all the other staff people would leave. So group went well, group was going fine. They would behave while they were in the room and they were meeting all of our expectations. But at the end of one group, when the staff came back to get their youth and take them back to their cottages, once they got outside of our environment, then a fight happened. So it wasn't really helpful. Um, so the uh, having it that big was unmanageable for the staff and for us. Because if it was a little smaller, the staff would have been, had easier control of the the youth that were there. And it, it didn't happen in our group per se, but it was around our group, right? And it wasn't about our group. It was actually about a gang situation and it had nothing to do with anything we did in group. But once they were outside it and the staff were distracted enough with the amount of kids, they, uh, anyway, they lost it. Okay, so watch the group and how it's developing and how the youth are developing within the group. And then again, keep your eyes on the program goal. So call it a program logic model, right? So you start with the end in mind. Um, some people have the end in mind of being like to lower recidivism. So we want to make it uh, supply program activities that... Um, decrease the chances that youth will come back to an incarceration setting. So, or you could have a program goal that is to uh, learn about your identity, um, whatever that is, your identity as a religious person or as a, a person of whatever you're, you want to learn about. So if that's what it is to learn about that, then education is going to be a strong component of the group. Now, um, Paolo Freire was a, a great um, teacher and um, uh, wrote great pedagogy models. And in his model of group pedagogy, he would have the teacher or the, the mentor in a kind of educational program is the subject matter expert per se, but the people in the group are the subject matter experts at their own lives. So bringing in knowledge and letting the group and their personal experiences inform how those things work together is really important. There's also great research um, on youth in incarceration settings that show that if a person comes in from the outside and puts their, um, what they want in the program onto the youth without considering contextual considerations or anything about their lives, that it actually increases the rate of reincarceration. And we don't want that. It is also true this, the in the reverse. If the youth are like, we want to do this and you as a as a mentor leader or are like, I don't want to do that at all. It sounds horrible, but you go along with it anyway. It also will create more uh, incarceration. So the sweet spot is coming together as that subject matter expert and facilitator, along with the lived experience of the youth who are the subject matter experts of their own lives. So that's just really important. All right, so now we're almost to the end. So tips and final thoughts. So balance, control, and facilitation. So facilitation is making the group do the work, right? Control is like how, how, uh, yeah, how we control things. Like you don't want to have a fight happen, right? So we do need to take control. And oftentimes 
um, now when youth are not uh, living up to the standard that we want for them or something's going down, we have our group norms that we just remind them of. We write, one of our rituals is actually to write down the group norms at the start of every meeting, freshly writing it down. So it uh, makes everybody um, remember what it is. It's written down and in front of everybody fresh. So balancing control and facilitation, get comfortable with silence. Um, if you're quiet enough, long enough, somebody will say something. Um, I used to have an intern who was so good at this, it made me uncomfortable. Um, be the person in the room who listens the most and talks the least, like that's a program goal. If difficult topics rise up, know that they trust you and they trust the group. And if your plans, again, do not meet the plans the youth are bringing in, adapt and integrate. And last, always be prepared. Have your tools and your materials on hand and ready. Yeah, we have had speaker problems with some of our presentations. So I, I broke down and bought a really good speaker. But that is necessary to have good uh, tools and materials and be ready and ready to go and not spin our circles or our wheels. Right. So while you are group facilitating, um, it's really important to be reflective, reflect on how you're doing and how the group is doing. Ask the mentees to reflect also. Are they getting out of group what they had hoped for? How might things be changed to help them get more out of it? We probably in our group um, re, um, re address our purpose. Um, about every six months, because we can have an entirely different group of youth every six months. Keep asking yourselves the, these kinds of questions. What stage is my group in? How can we get to the next stage? So if you're in the forming stage, how do you get to the norming? Or if you're in norming, how can you meet that pro, um, pro producing or productivity stage? Does your group feel a sense of ownership over the group? Is anyone dominating or being left out? We've had a great deal of conflict um, between two people in the last few um, groups that we have had, mainly because we have one person whose life circumstances trained them to shut down whenever conflict or higher voices rise up. And we have another person who uh, has been trained to uh, be loud and to not put up with other people in a very good way. So reminding uh, that step up, step back situation is a good uh, way of reminding people to do that. And then um, also because we were sending off the very, the one that gets shut down a lot um, because they were leaving to go away. The idea was, um, because usually we have a ritual around our leave taking and we try to say something that we think is great about the person or something we wish for their future. And so I made people do that in one word so that my person who is the complainer person um, would not have the opportunity to melt down the room. Because, uh, yeah, she's very domineering. So, and then asking how effective is the co are you working with your co-mentor you should always work in twos in a group it's really difficult to work in one um, although some groups if they're small enough one person is just fine so those are reflective questions to ask yourself on the journey and that's it we're at the end i thank you for watching this video and if you have any questions please feel free to email me uh, at terry at circlefaithfuture.org. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Bye.